Uh, first, uh, Paul Mita, who uh, is with Rio Tinto, a major uh, mining manufacturing conglomerate uh, with operations around the world. Um, Emmett uh, from Inside Partners, which is a uh, private equity firm that invests in software industry for growth. Uh, and finally, Raphael, uh, who leads Richardson RFP, which is an uh, aero electronics company. Um, so bringing a very diverse set of view and insights into this uh, topic, uh, which will be a, uh, 90 minutes doesn't do justice for uh, a conversation on this subject. So what I'd like to do before uh, we start our conversation is just kind of level set on what we mean by digital transformation, at least for the purposes of this discussion. So first, as you would imagine, because it's twin, is digital transformation is really at heart an innovation challenge. And that it's because it's all about how through digital means that we unlock value within our organizations. Um, secondly, in terms of what do we mean, what is digital? Um, so it really encompasses a broad set of technologies, everything from artificial intelligence and machine learning through to autonomy. So often it'll be hardware enabled uh, solutions, so robotics, autonomy, predictive analytics. Uh, so it really does cover a broad gambit of solutions and technologies. Uh, and lastly, I'd really like to put, really I'd put it into kind of three meta use cases. First, digital transformation is around reducing friction driving efficiency and productivity within an organization. Secondly, it's around driving productivity and efficiency and reducing friction with your customers, with your suppliers and your broader ecosystem. So more external facing. And third, it's about unleashing new products, new services, uh, and opening up new markets through digital based solutions. Um, so those are kind of the three buckets that we're going to be kind of thinking about in our discussions today. And there may be others that people can think of, and that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we level set um, today. So we're going to have a very rich discussion. So we're going to open up with asking each of the three panelists, starting with Emma, um, their views on really, you know, because of COVID, we've seen this acceleration uh, of digital. And obviously, most people that aren't in tech have seen this mostly uh, in the media through retail. And there's been an acceleration of digital transformation in companies. So I'm gonna ask each of them, starting with Emmett, so what are the accelerations that we're seeing up to now? And more importantly, what do you see are the accelerations going into the future that will continue post COVID? So um, I'll start with Emmett. Emmett, wanna uh, introduce your perspective on that? And then after you, we'll go to Pamita. Sure, happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna share from two different perspectives. One, from a digital business perspective, what are we seeing? And then second, I'll talk about from a, a technology standpoint, what are we seeing? What, what sorts of um, software businesses are accelerating really fast during the crisis? Um, first on the business side, I, I wrote a piece in 2018 called The Theater of Digital. Mm. And I had sort of a controversial point of view that everything going on leading up to the crisis was basically theater. And this included the incubators, the accelerators, the corporate venture activities, the, 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 torn, the torn jeans, the, the bold statements. Um, there was just a lot of theater going on and, and large global companies were sort of constrained because they had to grow revenue, they had to grow profit, they, were, uh, they had their headcount was set, their, their retail stores, their, their legacy infrastructure, legacy applications, they were really stuck um, before the crisis. But when the crisis hit, um, started interviewing IT leaders. I've interviewed about 100 now. And we saw the digital change basically broke loose. And it happened in March. And actually, uh, Rob Walcott wrote a fantastic piece in Forbes uh, pointing out that, you know, really, it's time to cross the digital Rubicon now. And the large global companies have five years to do that. And what we saw during the crisis from a, a digital business standpoint, I know everyone's been through this, but there was a massive acceleration of all customer facing projects. Um, you know, many different industries, whether it's automotive dealers jumping onto digital platforms, whether it's traditional, um, uh, you know, retailers and, and CPG players. <clears throat> I would say as we got through all that digital change, what's happening now is organizations are asking questions about how do we sustain that pace of change? For example, a bank, they were contemplating a two-year rollout of teams prior to the crisis, and then they got it done in 14 days during the crisis. 
And so they're asking the question, how do we maintain that going into the future? Um, organizations are, I think, contemplating a new period in the medium term. I'm, I'm calling it the end of the pendulum, where we're going to have to be basically cutting very, very deep from a cost perspective, while at the exact same time, innovating at a whole different level. And these things are going to have to happen in parallel, which we've never seen before. So a lot of organizations are contemplating, where am I going to find the cost takeout? And also, how am I going to take my innovation game to the next level? I think another thing that organizations are um, still contemplating now is what does my future virtual workplace look like? Um, so these are some of the things that are on, on the mind of the market. Um, also beginning to see companies thinking about, um, and this is really about sustaining the pace of digital change, getting more technology and digital leaders into the boardroom, and also getting more CEOs that are sort of digital natives. And I think if organizations are going to sustain this level of change, they have to get more leadership at the top of the company that, that understands digital. Um, from a technology standpoint, we've seen the cloud accelerate dramatically. And I would say uh, pre-crisis, the cloud was still in the hype curve, even though everybody had already claimed that it was done. <laughs> um, there was still a lot of work to do, and we've seen massive acceleration on cloud. I, I think also data came out of the hype cycle as well. There was a lot of talk about data being the new oil. But I think only during the crisis did we see data and analytics really break loose. Uh, we've also seen digital experience accelerate fast because it's it's so critical now to understand how your customers are interacting with all your digital properties. And then from a cyber standpoint, we've seen uh, next generation threat detection and next generation endpoint protection are accelerating. So I would say these are the top uh, the technology topics that are top of market, top of mind. I'm sorry in the market. Um, and then lastly, we just announced a virtual collaboration um, investment. The business is called Mural. So I think virtual collaboration tools are gonna, are gonna be a hot topic for the next six or 12 months. And also telemedicine is, is really a fast moving segment. So we just announced an investment in telemedicine as well. Yeah, but thank you. That's a great perspective from the private equity investment world. Good for unique perch on it. So Palmita, I mean, obviously, big industrial company, a very different perspective. Um, Rio has been a leader in many respects. So uh, what, what are some of the ex areas of acceleration that you've seen and going forward? And, and Emma, we're going to drive into some of those topics as well. Palmita. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Great to have uh, this conversation going on right now. It's going to be more topical and great to be here with you all. Um, very quickly, because I know this is, uh, you know, we are a global company, but we always like to speak a little bit about ourselves. Uh, Rio Tinto is um, the world's, one of the largest metal and mining company, have been on uh, the face of the earth for 147 years, uh, which means that we have been through a few cycles here and there. Um, and we have seen a couple of world wars and a few pandemics in our existence. And what we as Rio Tinto challenge ourselves is all of those learnings need to keep us on our feet, ready for the next 147 years or so. And today we are talking about digital, but uh, for us, digital has been almost a non-negotiable for the past decade or so. We've been on this journey for quite some time. Uh, Peter, you mentioned um, the robotics uh, industry and the journey that uh, the digital transformation has been on. Uh, we actually challenged ourselves to be on this journey for quite some time. And we started with robotics. Uh, for the last 10 years, we had our auto haul trucks, which were trucks that were automa uh, automated and running on our minds for several years. Uh, a couple of years back, we launched auto haul train, which was, uh, is very proud to say, that the world's largest robot it, uh, we are the world's largest iron ore producer, um, and for us, this this train basically commutes our production from Western Australia all the way to the ports, uh, 1,500 kilometers, uh, running by itself and operated by one person who sits at our Perth uh, operation center 1,700 kilometers away. And uh, you can imagine the, the world's largest miner moving all of that iron ore uh, just by that one automated train. So something to be, that we've always spoken about, been very proud of. Um, 
And then we have copper mines around the world. And for us, the two copper mines that we are heavily investing in are essentially going towards the center of the earth, which means we are into the ground mining. And our uh, projects recently have not been where we uh, just drill. We are actually sending robots and artificial intelligence uh, uh, data to give us where we need to be before we send people in, not only for safety, but also for gathering the intelligence, uh, because we are venturing into new, new areas for ourselves. Um, our last mine that uh, we have announced for Diary, that's going to be actually a virtual mine. So even before we dig on the earth, we are actually going to uh, create a virtual mine. The beta you you read the mine of the future. For us, the mines of the future are digital first before they become physical. And that's for a whole uh, range of reasons. Starts with uh, safety, moves on to productivity. And then today, data and data mining is not a nice to have, it's a must have. We have to talk about data and tell, you know, let the data talk to us back so that we can, uh, you know, accelerate. We have to get to market fast because our customers are getting uh, demanding on the products moving fast. So it's, it's the speed to execution which becomes very, very imperative for us. But now let's talk about the COVID era, right? We all went into this pandemic that basically put a burning platform on our digital journey um, to the point where we say three years worth of projects are getting delivered in three months. Very similar to Emmett, uh, you know, we, the projects that we were on, they just got accelerated. Now I'm at the receiving end of things, I, I have to admit. And the question that I'm asking is, why weren't we doing this before? Why weren't we on this accelerated platform before? Because we could have achieved so much more that we are doing in uh, the COVID timeframe. Um, I'll give you a few examples things that we are looking at right now. Let's talk about the problem statement first. We as miners, when we have a problem at any of our locations, what do we do? We turn around, we look, look at the experts around the world, we put them on a flight and take them over to the place where they need to be to solve the issues. Well, with COVID, we realize we can't put them on a flight. We cannot get them to different jurisdictions because every location has a different requirement for uh, quarantine and so on. And uh, we cannot really move people around as fast. And we cannot get people together. We're at the peak of uh, COVID, if you recall, um, people together wasn't something that we could advocate for. So you combine these three problems, and then you say, OK, so what's the solution? Well, it's digital. Because we had all that data. We were always using AI, uh, machine learning, AR, VR. Now we combined all of that. and. We're going to bring that data back to the people who are sitting at home and ensure that they are able to solve those problems virtually. So, you know, we are, we are actually mining through a virtual reality uh, right about today. And then, Peter, you also mentioned that the customer front is very critical. That everything that you do, that's more on productivity and keeping business running as usual. And we are deemed essential services for almost every jurisdiction that we work in, uh, which means we have to keep our production running. But we also have to address our customers' requirements, which means um, we have to provide solutions to our customers. And we are now venturing into areas like blockchain and saying, how do we ensure that not only for our productivity, but also for traceability and tracking purposes, we are able to give our customers solutions such that they can give their customers a much more um, heavier level of assurance than uh, where we are today. So blockchain is one. Um, I would say we are experimenting with everything that Emmett uh, also mentioned. Uh, Teams is used in almost every office, and we went from, um, let, let's just put it this way, we went from uh, a few offices around the world to uh, 5,000 offices at homes, because our operational people are still working from uh, our operational sites. So we say majority of our people are still going to uh, mines. Our offices suddenly became very spread out. And uh, we are enabling our employees with the data, with the information, such that they can make rightful decisions. And if I can end on that last, um, um, I know Emmett also mentioned this, but COVID made us realize that there are two realities we are dealing with. Mental health, physical well-being of our employees who are juggling with work from home, along with family at home. So managing work, work 
your work-related requirements along with your family-related requirements, which is quite a juggle. It can put a strain on people. And at the same time, uh, the demand of things are increasing exponentially. You cannot go to office to have printouts and you know all the processes that were manual cannot keep going on as usual. So we are keeping digital a real um, solid toolkit for us to accelerate towards this 21st century digital transformation that we are into. Uh, I'll stop there, Peter. Looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much. A great perspective from a you know, 140-year-old company, industrial company. Uh, exciting to see you doing that journey. So so far, I've got. <clears throat> two years of work done in 14 days, three years and three months. Goodness, I'm, we're going to have a bit of a discussion about that. Raphael, I mean, you have a totally different approach. You're providing electronic and IoT solutions to companies. You've got your own company, obviously. What are, what are you seeing as big trends? Because you're talking to a lot of companies, obviously. So what are your big trends acceleration? I was like, uh, you know, Peter, I was in Wuhan early December. Uh, by the end of January, my team was getting ready to celebrate the Chinese New Year. And mm -hmm. immediately they went to lockdown in all countries. I mean, Asian countries first, China, Singapore, uh, Taiwan. Then by end of February, Europe moved to that uh, lockdown. And then March, we started seeing the lockdown in the Americas. So the speed of, act of uh, this transformation has accelerated. I would call it even we exceeded the light speed. Uh, which is normally a limit, not only for businesses, Peter, but also for our society. So like you, you know, Emmett and Pramita uh, mentioned, we shifted working, uh, studying, interacting, conducting business from homes in a matter of weeks. Uh, retail, entertainment, healthcare, well, uh, wellness, work, human interaction shifted entirely uh, uh, digitally, which is amazing. I mean, if you look in the history of humanity, few weeks or months, it's like nanosecond. So I think this speed of transformation is, is really amazing. There is another thing what I believe is happening. All the crises that we went through, like 9-11 or 2008, 2009, created really a, an Im impressive waves of innovation. And that we saw that in 2000, uh, post-2008 crisis, that exponential growth of platforms, platforms like Airbnb and Uber and Netflix and Amazon. I believe that this global crisis uh, or this pandemic that we are living will accelerate this disruption. So the demand for IoT solution, for example, is skyrocketing. I mean, we're seeing the same thing. I mean, companies are talking about deploying IoT solution for over years and they've been most of the cases failing and now they are accelerating the adoption of these new technologies. The same thing with supply chain. I mean, we've seen massive disruption in supply chain and we're still going through that supply chain. So there is a lot of innovation going in the supply chain also. So I believe that the amplitude of changes ahead of us are, are massive. I really believe in that notorious disruptors will be disrupted. A little virus disrupted Airbnb or Uber People don't use uh, Airbnb easily as before because they are worried about this disruption done by, uh, by a virus. So how do you manage, uh, imagine, Peter, that pre-COVID-19, health authorities will share DNA sequence of a novel virus so quickly? Have you imagined that you know, very bureaucratic uh, health organization around the globe would be approving vaccine trials in a matter of weeks? versus years. So this transformation wave really ahead of us will accelerate the deployment of Industry 4.0 or the fourth digital transformation. So for us as a company, as an organization, we see really a lot of opportunity uh, to grow and create new value stream for our customers and, and partners. And it's really an exciting time. Great. Raphael, thank you very much. It really is. So let's dive into one of these areas. So I was at the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference last July, and this is weaving together two things. And the target EP of strategy said that digital transformation is not a technology issue. It's an issue of working, how we work, our mindset, and our approach, which wrapped up is the culture of a company. You guys have mentioned how do you, and I've interviewed about 15 CEOs for a paper that I published that, and every one of them said, Emmett, you brought this up per minute, is how do you maintain the urgency in a company that enables us to do things in months that were planned for years? 
Um, and they're all worried that the companies will just snap back. If you put those two things together, I think it's a pretty powerful uh, notion. So how do you make sure you keep this? Because I'm a little skeptical that companies will be able to maintain this, you know, because crises are a mother of all invention. So uh, start with you, Parameter, and then go to Emma, or then to Raphael, then to Emma, reverse order. So, Parameter, how in Rio are you thinking about why you've done this? Amazing? How do you make sure you don't snap back? And is there a technology? How do you think of it? So, is sure, the sure. guy right? Peter, I can completely understand your skepticism about companies falling back to its natural, uh, you know, na natural inertia of doing things at a slower pace and you know going through the bureaucracy and the red, red tape. Um, I, what I would start by saying: Do we have a choice in giving up the, the momentum that we have today? Because what we don't have assurance of is today we have COVID, but what what do we don't know about tomorrow? And what we are hearing from the health authorities is this is only the start. So there could be many more such disruptions, whether it's on the health side or otherwise, that we are projecting. And if you take nine months back, uh, we were not talking about COVID, but one of the topics that we were definitely talking about was climate change. Mm. And climate change was paramount in front of everybody's um, minds and mindset. And we were challenging ourselves and what do companies do to deliver on climate change? Guess what? Digital was coming across as a solution even then. But you have to use your data better. You have to use your data smarter to ensure that we are mining it for something which is productive for the future. In a post-COVID world, what I also see is people lines of or, or boundaries between health, um, health management, climate change, ESG, and the trade and tariff issues are all becoming very blurred. Because if we're moving from one topic to another, these lines are kind of getting, these dots are getting joined very quickly together. So companies essentially, I would say, probably have less of a luxury of falling back into what they used to do in terms of evaluation and acceleration and movement. And then the fact that employees are also saying that we are actually more productive now. But thanks to digital and thanks to the work that we have done over the past six months, we are able to take products to market quicker, faster, and easier. We are able to increase our own productivity quicker, faster, and easier. And what we don't know is when we open the doors and we all step out, I know we might be in different places in different uh, states in the US or in Europe, uh, but for Chicago perspective, I'll say when we open the door and we walk out, um, we don't know what the world will be like. It has changed. It is a little different. The companies have to react to that really quickly. But um, lastly, they also have to address the new demand with much higher velocity than we have done before. And digital definitely is one of the enablers that allows us to do it. Peter, I'll stop there. Back to you. In the history of humanity, we've been through many transformations. I just remind people that we went through a first industrial, second, a third industrial, and this is the fourth. And maybe there would be a fifth and a sixth. So I'd like to share with you our digital transformation, our journey as an organization, and how we help customers address their challenges in their digital transformation. Just to highlight a little bit of our experience, what worked, what didn't work. So our digital transformation journey, Peter, started many years ago and evolved in several phases. I know very little company, even if they've been successful in digital transformation, they have been mature digitally. So I think there is a constant evolution. And this period of crisis is just accelerating it, but it's not ending it. So I think that even as a company, we will continue to evolve in our transformation. So to become a digital transformation therapist, therapist like we want to be to our customers, we started our journey first by conducting our digital transformation analysis in ourselves. So let me explain what I mean by that. So we are very focused in RF technology and IoT. IoT is a horizontal technology that is helping company accessing data for the first, the fourth industrial uh, revolution. So we know that collecting, processing, analyzing data is key to digital transformations. So to help our customer, so basically we successfully de deploy IoT solution, we had to define clearly what is the problem that we try to solve here. And what we found out 
is that the IoT deployment to help digital transformation requires first a clear business case. You mentioned that earlier when we started, Peter. What is the objective first? Then you need a deep knowledge of several technology stacks, and it goes from uh, edge compute, RF, 5G, security, cloud, AI, machine learning, and so on. So the key question was how to integrate all those complex technologies and how to scale them. But at the same time, we found is that the markets in all world, we're shifting from a traditional economy to a membership economy, okay? So we had to not only transform our go-to-market, but also our business model. So we had to, to think about we becoming not just a supplier of products, to a, become a supplier of products and products as a service or even an outcome. Mm -hmm. So back to what makes digital transformation successful or not, I don't believe it's, it's about technology. I mean, it's really not about technology, and it's clear and obvious, and we went through that. I strongly believe that successful digital transformation of organization requires first a clear vision from the executives, from the C-suite. So defining clearly objectives, meaning are we going after profitable growth? Are we going about after productivity, customer experience enhancement, or do we want to avoid to be disruptive, like blockbuster disruptive? by Netflix. The second element for successful digital transformation to my eyes are changing the mindset and the culture of organization. So if you don't have the, that mindset of change and not being fearful of change, then it's going to be challenging. The third element I believe extremely important is having the right talent. It's not because you're going to hire a chief digital officer, we're going to hire a lot of computer scientists that your digital transformation will be successful. Our, my experience in, in my organization, my customers around the globe and partners and suppliers is that it's you're better off training your own talent and give them the opportunity to learn and, and grow and develop their knowledge of their model of business of working market to digitalize it. The other element for me is extremely important is having an agile structure. If you are a big corporation with a lot of bureaucracies, it's going to be very challenging to be successful in your digital transformation. So for me, speed of execution, speed of failure, and speed of learning are extremely important. Yep. You have to take the risk to disrupt yourself before someone else disrupts you. So another point that we've been addressing is really setting different success metrics because a traditional business is mostly a PML and a balance sheet, but the returns that you're going to get from digital transformation are not as quick or are as relevant in terms of ROI as a traditional PML and balance sheet approach to the business. The way you incentivize people also have to be different. So basically, my view of this digital transformation is like you are permanently uh, having your business model in a, in a better version, and you have to fine-tune it constantly. And I don't think it's, it's going to be end. Yeah. Raphael, thank you. We're going to dive deep into this about traditional companies. Emma, again, you know, interesting page from the private equity world. How, 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 do you, how are you looking at this in terms of maintaining this pace uh, within companies? I would like to answer your your previous question, if that's okay, because I've got a I've got an interesting insight there, and then yeah, I'm happy to answer the second one as well. We just had a yeah, we did say again. Awesome, yeah, we just had. In addition to the twenty five interviews that I've done with uh, Global Two Thousand executives, we've done uh, twenty five virtual roundtables uh, during the crisis, and we we typically have uh, fifteen leaders like we have on the call today. And we had one this week with a world famous economist that was basically talking about all the previous pandemics and showing us how fast the world recovered once the pandemic was over. And the thing he was showing us is they, the world kind of snapped back fairly quickly after, after each one of those pandemics. Um, he was also showing us that COVID, even though it's tragic and extreme and you know really challenging in the grand scheme of things is smaller compared to some of these other pandemics. Um, but what he pointed out was that we, this time, we have fundamental structural change 
you know, because basically the the workplace is going to be changed forever. We are going to have a hybrid virtual workplace in the future. And consumer behavior has been changed forever. And then the other thing that's that's happening, and we had a we had a roundtable last week with a former CEO of one of the world's biggest telcos, and he talked about the harmonic convergence of 5G, IoT, cloud, data, and there's going to be this convergence, you know, as as 5G sort of fully comes to market, uh, which is going to be in the 2022, 2023 20, timeframe. Um, so the economist was saying that he believes that we'll be at pre-COVID level from, a, from just a global economy standpoint by the end of 2022. And then we had this 5G expert talking about the harmonic convergence of 5G cloud and data. So I think what we're actually going to see is a massive kind of turbo boost acceleration, I, I think is what we're going to see. And it's hard, it's hard to imagine that at the moment, but, but based on what I'm hearing from these various um, thought leaders, I, I think that's actually might what happen, might, might be what's going to happen. Um, as far as, you know, sustain, sustaining the pace of digital, digital change, I mean, it is a, it is a tough one because, um, you know, you really have to maintain a crisis mindset. We had a one of my events, we had a board member from a, the largest, one of the largest water water utilities in, in Europe. And she said overnight they transformed from a waterfall shop to an agile shop. They had been trying forever to become an agile delivery shop, but within days transformed from a waterfall to agile shop. And I asked her, you know, how could that be? And she said, we just had to. I mean, they they had no choice. <laughs> they had to get all these you know digital capabilities out to their consumers. There was no choice. They were in the middle of a crisis. It just happened. And so, you know, I think that's the, the question: is How do we maintain this crisis mindset? And I don't I don't really have an answer to that. I think it's a it's an open question. Is so, and I've written a lot about this and. It up at the Fortune Brainstorm Tech, you know, we have the CEOs of Walmart and Target and you know, mattress companies, so a lot of people talking. And it was that traditional incumbent companies, not tech companies like Amazon, right through to emerging companies, the likes that uh, Emmett invests in, is that traditional companies will not be the disruptors. You know, they focus using digital transformation to drive efficiency and cost and aren't very good at driving it into new products and services and new markets, which is what tech companies. Amazon and also the markets uh, don't reward high growth, low profit traditional companies. Amazon gets away with equity growth, not profit growth, and therefore is a dangerous competitor with vast resources and acts like a startup at speed. So is there, Wilt, do you think traditional companies, you know, and the, the other fact is most, you know, there's been analysis done that 80% of digital projects fail at traditional companies. Okay, so when you put this all together, and notwithstanding, you know, we've seen Walmart and Target do amazing things because of a crisis, is do you think these traditional companies will succeed in their digital transformations to create value, or will they be disrupted by other companies, full stop? And there's always going to be exceptions. So, Peter, you're a traditional company. So uh, I'll start with you and then go to you, Emmett. So they're Raphael. So Parmen, what do you think? Peter, I can't get away from being called a traditional company after just claiming that we have 147. I accept that. But I will say that in Rio, the, the success factor that we have and how we kind of position ourselves and saying the legacy that we are uh, living in is the work that has been done for the last 147 years. And the work that we'll be doing is setting the tone for the next 147. So in case you didn't get that, we intend to be here for a very long time. Um, but what we also do is uh, we, we actually say that we are a 147-year-old company that has to challenge itself of thinking like a startup every day. We are not going to say that we are a startup, but we are pushing our, and uh, Raphael mentioned the talent, we are pushing the new generation of talent to come in and challenge us and saying, okay, what does it take to act and behave like a startup internally. Externally, we are still a commodity player. We make our ore, we make copper. Yes, I should have started, we also make diamonds. We actually get diamonds out of the earth that usually attracts attention. 
Um, we make aluminium, we make uh, borates that goes into your borax and fertilizers. But at the end of the day, we are a company that digs stuff and moves them around the world. And while we have done that for 147 years, which means we not only have the customer interaction, the customer network, and their faith in us, we also have the data of the past 147 years to know how do you manage through different cycles, different issues, different uh, challenges, including things like World War. We were there when the World Wars were taking place, whether it's the first or the second. How do you use that experience to better us for the next 147 years? Now, enough about the timeline, but I do want to address um, you know, your question, and probably I'll address something that Raphael mentioned, that as a traditional company, even if we are actually a traditional company, the skepticism comes, how do you make digital work? And the reason I mentioned all our different products is each of them have a different go-to-market strategy. And it first starts with thinking about each product line in two, two segments. One is those who have to make, make them best, make them well, and make sure you're concentrating on just making them. And those that have to sell, sell them well, understand your customers. Our customers will tell us what we need to do on our front for our products. We then take that input and feed it back to operations to say, this is what the next round of changes that we are going to do. And this is how we're going to transform ourselves for the future because that's what our customers want. So customer centricity is very, very high on our agenda. And we always say, listen to the market. The market will give you the feelers. We cannot avoid them. We feed that back into the people who actually have made their living and are fantastic at delivering projects and making stuff that we go out and take to the, uh, to the uh, market for human progress. But then there is a second tranche, Peter, that you were referring to is, um, are we going to succeed in this digital world, in this digital transformation, if as a traditional, I'm going to airport that because I'm going to challenge all of you to call me a traditional company, uh, but as a traditional company, do we succeed in the digital world? And I, I believe, Peter, you also mentioned, and I think it was corroborated across the panel members, that uh, oh, a learning from the COVID is the immense amount of collaboration that took place. And frankly, we couldn't have survived if the world hadn't come together. On one hand, we had a great humanitarian issue where people, you know, we lost several, I, I won't even get the number to depress the world, but we have lost people. On the other hand, this COVID has also told us that humanity comes together in an unprecedented way. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a shame that it's this kind of a pandemic to really you know, bring this point to the forefront, but humanity came together. Companies came together. Companies came together. And this is the first time that government, companies, and people, consumers, are all actually coming together, even in saying, we need to fix this issue for humanity first. But in doing that, one of the things that came across was the need for partnership and the need for collaboration. We are not going to claim to be uh, the likes of Amazon, Google, um, Apple, or uh, other tech companies. We make stuff. We, we live on the, tangi the tangible products that we make. But at the same time, the partnership is very alive. And for that, we actually give full credit to our partners in the supply chain that we have. Uh, they stepped up to it as much as we demanded a change in our work. They stepped up to it with us, whether it's our um, our haul truck providers um, across the world. You know, one of them sits right here in Chicago, um, or if it's uh, the the people who actually provide the services, whether it's uh, you know the the teams or uh, you know Outlook and um, the Cisco's of the world to ensure that we are able to deliver and keep our work going seamlessly. Now, on the other hand, the collaboration has to extend to our partners. We also have stepped up to our partners to say, what do you need? And for those who are more uh, customer-facing companies, those companies who are our, our customers are actually getting indication of the new world that we are going into. Consumer behavior, I think uh, one of us mentioned, consumer behaviors uh, not forever changed. And this consumer behavior uh, is the signals are coming back to us. And we have to step up and make sure that we are providing solutions to our customers to help them address those new consumer behaviors. So 
I want to emphasize that whether it's traditional or non-traditional companies, whether it's disruptive or non-disruptive, I will say that uh, if you've lived through 147 years, we've gone through a few disruptions in our existence. And the one thing that we do know is always hear your customers, make sure you're in partnership mode, and always uh, listen to the communities and the suppliers because there are signals and we will need this whole ecosystem to work together. And what COVID gives us as a clear example is when different companies, different supply chains work together, we can deliver stuff. Vaccines can get done and uh, you know, research can be done in a short time frame. They, you know, acceleration of the approvals can happen in a shorter frame and we are keeping our fingers crossed for the of the vaccine will also take place in a very short time frame. So um, my, my only thing would be collaboration and partnership is absolutely good. Cool. And I, I think that collaboration ecosystem is important. And maybe when you're responding to this, can you also address this issue? Because I think this ecosystem, you know, uh, Professor Mahan Sami from uh, Kellogg wrote where, you know, our innovation is only as powerful as the ecosystem that we have around us. I mean, so when you look at the big non-tech versus the tech industry, but also startups and you guys are invested in companies like Shopify, Ultrix, love Ultrix, they're just down the road from me here in Southern California, great company. Awesome. Yeah, but you know, this ecosystem, the role of startups with non-tech companies as part of that success factor. Do you want to kind of amplify it in that area too, please? Thank you. Yeah, I'll do, I'll, I'll do both. I mean, what's, um, what's fascinating, you know, Insight Partners, as you mentioned earlier, is a is a scale up private equity investor, mm -hmm. and uh, we're tracking about two hundred thousand software companies globally that have gotten Series A money or more. And our investment model is we want to catch them at the inflection point. Yeah. So when the, when the business unlocks and they start growing hundred percent or more, we want to invest at that moment. And what's I guess frightening in some ways is we only find two hundred. 50 of those companies globally out of 200,000 we only find 250 at that inflection point and then we down select to about 50 investments per year what causes that inflection point is market timing that's what causes the acceleration if you think back to what I was saying earlier about the virtual collaboration tool they've been in business eight years but now with COVID their business has completely unlocked same thing with telemedicine. That business had been around for quite some time. And, uh, you know, the adoption of telemedicine had been, quote unquote, anemic. Uh, but then with COVID, it, it completely unlocked. So um, timing is everything. And I think, you know, to answer your original question, I think corporations have to learn how to innovate. And my, my view for quite some time is I think spin outs are ultimately the survival move, right? These large companies have extraordinary assets. They have customers, they have data, they have infrastructure, they have a lot of incredible assets. And I think they have to really learn how to spin companies out. And, you know, within the firm, we, we, we built a program six years, ago, six years ago called Insight Ignite. And I think just from a philanthropic standpoint, it's critical that these large companies survive. Because if you imagine, you know, if, a thousand of the global 2000 went away uh the world is not going to be a more peaceful place um you know there's going to be a we're going to be dealing with a lot of issues if these companies don't yeah. survive so i spend a lot of time thinking about um how to innovate to your point um i think and um you know um Pramita mentioned it earlier but the back channel has been on fire during the crisis i mean cios have been connecting with all of their former colleagues and you know it's not happening on linkedin it's all happening on the back channel and the way they've been able to get things done that normally would take two years and 14 days is heavy heavy collaboration on the back channel and so i think absolutely going into the future open innovation is also going to get redefined and it's going to be critical to have access to all the technology you need all the insights you need um, i think the days of traveling to the Silicon Valley and, and looking at a couple companies or traveling to Israel and looking for a couple companies, that's not going to work um, as we exit the crisis. And this is really what, what we're building at Insight Partners is a, is a strategic partner that can give access to technology in a one-stop location. Because I think it's going to be critical to define the problems, confirm that the timing is now to solve that problem, find the right technology, and then go you know, at, at speed and get it done. No, Emma, thank you. And a couple of comments there before I hand over to you, Raphael, is we did a lot of work with Baker Hughes, 
uh, and mapping out their digital solution map. And Baker Hughes is a big oil services company. And their CTMO, uh, Derek, quickly realized that 90% of these digital solutions would die and wither on the vine inside their internal business. And they're a pretty savvy company. So they built a very sophisticated image your point spin out model, uh, which combined a, they raised their own venture fund, which sits outside the company. Uh, they've created like seven spin out digital companies that are unique staff with extra venture capital and plus they did a joint venture with C3AI, which is Tom Siebel's company. And 80% of their new digital solutions are put into those companies and 20% are put back to the core business where it makes sense. And that model is really, they saying they're getting things done both technically and in the market at speed that they couldn't even contemplate in their company, even if they wound it up. You know, so I think that's really important. And the last one was Ford, which is uh, I, the CIO that I was talking to said that they quick, they wanted to, you know, in autonomy, be quick like a startup. They realized they could take years to re-engineer Ford to be like that. And that's why they spun Argo. They bought Argo, then spun it out separately. And GM's done the same one. So I think this kind of spin out mentality really does have to take hold. But that's pretty unique. Not a lot of companies think this way. In traditional industry, sorry, Parmita, or in Anyway, there's a, so it's really interesting. Really, yeah, fascinating. Really, really quick. There's a early stage uh, VC in Israel called Team Eight. Mm. It's really interesting. What they've done is they've built a model where they have a very sophisticated way to source the problems that they want to solve, that the market wants to solve. Mm. Um, they have an entrepreneur in residence program, so they can um, just place founders into businesses. They know exactly where they're going to get the talent from the um, 8200 in Israel. And they also have a fund. And so they know exactly where the capital is going to come from. And it's exactly what you talked about. I think it's really all about talent, funding, you know, finding the right problems and then spinning, spinning businesses out. Yep. That's fantastic. Great. Raphael, have you, uh, I mean, you guys are doing a lot of transformation and working with a lot of companies clearly. So your thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Peter, I mean, I, I'm going to answer your question and then I, I'll develop first. I think there will be a Darwinian evolution. So like, you know, dinosaurs will disappear. Some will transform and new, new startup will thrive. So I think it's going to be, there is not a, a single answer. There's going to be a combination of different uh, topics. And I'd like to share with you, if I narrow the digital transformation to what we do, IoT, for example, all the, uh, you know, the forecaster and the analyst will tell you that IoT opportunity or 80% of the opportunity is not in consumer electronics. It's really an industrial market. So assets, manufacturing, etc. So the biggest opportunity really for digital transformation around the globe, around small medium-sized companies or big manufacturing companies so that's very important the challenge is really we have to do collectively as as a group much more work to demystify digital transformation i can share with you an anecdote that i met the second in command of a large japanese infrastructure manufacturer and we had a formal meeting and he basically asked me if we can help him provide his company with predictive maintenance solutions. He could not articulate exactly why and how. So I think it's important that we, uh, you know, help uh, in, in different ways, you know, demystify that Industry 4.0 and, and explain and try to understand what is the end game that they, those customers are, are looking, or those companies are looking for, uh, first. The second reason what I believe going to be very challenging for traditional or I would call analog, non-digital uh, company is the agility. I mean, there is a lot of inertia and resistance to change that hinders that digital transformation of those companies. So that's why I think uh, the idea that uh, Emmett shared about spin-off could be an option. I mean, there is a lot of reflection done in our customer base or supplier bases basically creating a uh, you know, kind of startup, not in that bureaucratic, you know, cumbersome, slow moving organization, but very close to the organization, but not too far. So because the risk is that those initiative of innovation will 
be rejected like a transplant of an organ into a traditional uh, organization. And lastly, I fully agree with Paramita's comment about ecosystem collaboration. I think companies have to open uh, to other companies. They, nobody has the answer alone to the digital transformation. So they need to create alliances, partnership with suppliers, and even eventually working with competitors to create new norms. Because if I look today, there is a lot of individual experimentation, successful some and some are not successful, but there is no norm, there is no standards of what digital transformation means. And I would dive into the IoT case, there is still an issue of being able to scale those uh, IoT deployments. And so we are just at the beginning, and I see really see the opportunity bigger than the challenges. Great. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to put it back, Emma, way back at the beginning, you mentioned you just dropped kind of a little drop into the bucket, which was board, the board commitment and the executive talent. So uh, in January of this year, I was interviewing Lynn Lafferty, who sits on the board, interestingly, of Saudi Aramco on one hand and GlaxoSmithKline on the other. It was about digital transformation, actually. And she said that unless a board has a subcommittee essentially dedicated to this effort, she doesn't believe that companies can seriously lean into digital transformation. And she was comparing Glaxo, which has you know, its subcommittee with board talent that understands innovation R&D in the context of pharma. But she said in her industrial and there's other companies she knows obviously, uh, don't. And she said, you can't make it happen unless you have that board commitment. So, Emmett, I'll start with you, and then probably you're in your know, board. So, I, I kind of agree with us. So, I'd be interested to see a your thoughts about that, and b if that is the case, how do boards, in these traditional industries and company companies, actually open up this area in their boards? So, to be serious. So, Emmett, why don't since you dropped the that <laughs> motion, do you want to start first? With? <laughs> Well, yeah, we had a we had a discussion on this topic as well, and uh, there's a really fascinating piece of research out there. Uh, the professor's name is Peter Weil. He's at MIT, mm -hmm. and he basically he and his team studied every board above two billion in revenue in the U.S. and tried to analyze who has a digital board and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, they they deemed the digital board to be three board members or more that have technology in their background. And they used machine learning to crawl through all the board bios and identify which companies had a digital board. There were, there were only 24% of those businesses that had a digital board. Then they compared the financial performance. They compared revenue growth, market cap growth, profitability, and those 24% far, far excel, you know, outperformed the other 76% that didn't have a digital board. So I think mm -hmm. it, it's actually empirically proven now <laughs> that boards that understand digital, the companies are going to perform better. Um, th the other thing he talked about um, is that it's actually not so much about the technology. It's more about understanding how to transform business models. And that's really what the board has to think about is how are we going to transform how we go to market, how we interact with our customers, how we do business. And so you have to have that baseline technology knowledge combined with business knowledge to sort of think about how to transform the, 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 the business model. And I think what's exciting about this for IT leaders is if you take, I did the math you know, on the back of a napkin, if you take the global 2000 and you apply that math, there's gonna be 5,000 board seats in the future for, IT, for IT leaders, <laughs> which, is, yeah. which is really exciting. Um, yeah, it's hard for us to do I mean, the, the other thing that, that you know, what's clear during the discussion is that once you have a digital board, they then come to the conclusion that we need a we need a digital CEO, right? Um, and it's really the combination of the CEO and the board that that makes the the growth happen. So, Pramisa, how's Rio Tinto thinking about this? I know you're going to point the board, so I'm putting you in a bit of a hot seat. But just yeah. how, how do you think about this? Well, let, let, let me start off with a live example. We are, uh, you know, we are miners. Basically, geological data is uh, at the core of uh, what we do. So we have been scanning the world in terms of where are the resources and how do we actually get to them. 
uh, through every crisis, every cycle, the one thing that Rio has not done is the eye of the ball from uh, innovation and exploration. So, and the two go hand in hand and actually sit very close with the strategy discussions. So growth, innovation, and strategy are actually combined together when they're uh, spoken about. And the reason I'm actually going that, and I'm pivoting off something that uh, Emmett said, that um, if, if I take you back, probably even 10 years, the data that our growth and innovation or the exploration team would do, would have, is they would have gone through data, and that data would actually get passed and seen over 11 years. By the time it came to actual execution, think about the time frame that we have lost in terms of how the data is actually being put to full use. Thanks to cloud, and I believe uh, somebody mentioned that cloud technology has really, uh, skyrocketed. Um, I can corroborate as, an, uh, as, an, as a user that uh, thanks to cloud and all the technology that is available, the same data is now being sent up and brought down in a matter of six hours. So now compare 11 years to six hours. Now, our broad spectrum might have different requirements just because of the nature of the beast that we are, but if you think about that one example, who will shy away from saying, we have a different world coming to us because now our exploration team can actually go from a concept that they woke up with to actually going out and saying, this is a live project that we are going to start working on within a matter of months. And the, the board is looking for that acceleration of uh, projects. The board is looking for that acceleration of, uh, of ideas coming back to us because one thing we do know that buildings are still getting made, cars are still getting uh, manufactured. We will still keep drinking from our cans and uh, what we learned for, was when there is a pandemic and people are not feeling that well, they I like to stay home and they like to drink beer, they like to drink their coke, and they use cans. So our metal is going, our materials are going to every place where human progress still needs to continue. And when it comes to digital, the digital our strategy as one of the key enablers that gets us there. I'll, I'll give you another example and then I'll hand, hand it back to you. Um, if we take our eye off digital and just look around on everything else that's happening around the world, you will see every second um, news article is talking about geopolitical issues. Nationalism is high, protectionism is high. Uh, countries are asking for more when it's not coming from within the countries. So free trade as we knew it even 10 years back is coming kind of taking a different form and different definition. And no board will actually shy away from addressing that geopolitical issue. And data and digital are actually coming together as a key resource to help answer and address those issues. And that's why I revert back to something that I'd said, what we are actually entering is blockchain and things like you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning because that's giving us live data to tell us how do we navigate these new waters that we are entering into? How do we navigate and address every jurisdiction that we are entering or exiting from? How do we make sure that our data is actually speaking to the people who are asking these questions? How do we address trade-related questions, tariff-related questions, and then transparency-related questions in a more seamless and authentic manner where they don't have to wait for somebody sitting in the back office, some quant churning up data after data in terms of an Excel file, but we are able to do it very seamlessly through the digital filing cabinet that we have created. So today, the, the digital um, strategy is definitely very much core to our physical strategy. And we always say products of today are physical, products of tomorrow can easily be digital. So I'll stop there, uh, Peter, back to you. I'm actually frozen on that. Maybe it's frozen. Yeah, maybe I, 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 yeah, I jump in and answer uh, Peter's question. So I, I, I fully agree with you, uh, Emmett. Um, you know, uh, of course, digital boards and digital CEOs are, are very important in making digital transformation successful. But I would go one level uh, beyond that. 
I really believe, and I've seen that, you'll probably seen the same, that shareholder and stakeholder in general have to embrace also digital transformation. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Here in Chicago, in the Midwest, under the Rust Belt, as well as Mittelstand companies in Germany, for example, that is the market valuation of hardware company is maybe five to seven times less than SaaS companies, for example, or services companies. So there is much more tolerance towards innovative companies and their market valuation than traditional companies. So that's make it very difficult to shift, even if the, the CEO and the board is very uh, supportive in those digital transformation. I'll give you an example. I mean, we all know about Amazon. I mean, we the market was tolerant around Amazon not making any OI or profit for several years. If it's a traditional hardware, middle stand German or, or, or Asian or uh, American company, in hardware, we will not have any tolerance for, for losses. So I think that that's something that, uh, that needs to be addressed or already and, and tolerance of um, you know, traditional company going through their digital transformation. And that's a good, that's a good point. I think um, you know what's what, what's interesting. Um, oh, are you there? Yeah. Sorry, we have our our uh, technical expert back. We lost we lost Peter. Okay. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> Ah, oh, great. <laughs> we missed you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Well, Peter, we can go We can go on to the next topic. Oh, great. Thanks, Brian. That was good. Um, so actually, I'll put out a challenge. So, uh, and this is just a comment, because I think the way traditional non-tech companies think about things is we'll get, we will make digital transformation work, but... The challenge I put out is, will you be a valuable company? And I think the object lesson, particularly in industrial, is the auto industry. So many auto execs I speak to still cannot understand why Tesla is valued higher than all of them put together. And they make more cars, they have more employees and more factories. And that's because the market has determined that Tesla is the future and they're not. And because it's operating in all the things, Raphael, you mentioned, at speed, with vision, with execution, with the talent. Uh, and even though it's small relative to the others, it's way more valuable. So I think that's a big challenge to incumbent companies. Uh, you may still be around and you still be valuable and you still have big revenue, but you won't be valuable relative to the disruptors. So I was putting that out there because Tesla is not an auto company. It is a digital company that just happens to make things. So anyway, I'll put that out there. Uh, for what it's worth. Uh, I got slightly disrupted with my own line of thinking now. Um, let me think where I want to go. So actually, Pramit, I'm going to just jump back to you because Emmett talked about you know, the role of startup and talked about ecosystems. I interviewed Brad Keywell uh, actually three weeks ago, and he said big companies are not friendly places for startups and emerging tech companies. And he said traditional companies should have a chief startup officer that should make those big companies a friendly receiver. And I sit on boards of startups and I sit on venture fund boards. Most of the companies have a nightmare with large companies. It's just kill them. So how do you think about that? Are you talking about ecosystem collaboration, partnering, you're an incumbent? How do you make yourself a friendly place, a friendly receiver, I guess, for all these emerging companies? Peter, I can just hear Brad say that because he's definitely said that to me. Uh, so, yes. So, um, and if you think about it from his experience, from where he's having actually uh, you know, started 26 such companies, um, you have to take his point into consideration. Now, on the other flip side, and he's heard me say this, that um, we, we cannot pretend after having been a traditional company to suddenly behave like a startup overnight. But what we say is think like a startup company, but you still have to do things a little differently. And the, and the previous topic was around board. If you think about a publicly traded company and the amount of compliance and the 
amount of vigilance that the board and the executive committee has to have in ensuring that we are doing what we as a traded company. The asks are completely different. And here, here is a challenge back to the panel from my side as a traditional, having been casted as a traditional company by almost all of you now. Um, the challenge back is digital transformation is good, but alongside there has to be an equally disruptive movement around cybersecurity. You cannot ha go on a path of digital transformation without ensuring that your house foundation and everything that you hold true to the world today is disrupted. And every investor, every shareholder, every employee, every board member, every uh, CEO and his or her executive uh, team is going to be wondering about that. Because it's easy to start up something and keep moving forward. Unless you've secured what you're moving into and out of, you cannot move forward. And today, and I'm sure each one of us will probably hear it, that while you know, COVID has accelerated and put digital transformation on a burning platform, we are all looking back and saying, do we have our plugs plugged into the right places? Are we secure? Because cybersecurity threats have also increased exponentially. And that's a big challenge that we have, as a, having been around for a bit longer, than a regular startup company, having gone through those phases where we have uh, had challenges and had to manage through things, and answering to the, the shareholders and making sure that we are keeping their money safe and giving them the returns that is apt, we are doing it in a rightful way. Does that make the decision-making process longer than we have had in a, tradition, in a regular startup? Absolutely. So full credence to uh, Rad's comment. But um, the only thing that we have to secure is we take these big steps in a small fashion, but we take tiny steps every day just to make sure that all those tiny steps when we are taking, we know that we have secured our shareholders' interest at all times. We have secured our asset interest at all times. And we as Rio Tinto, I won't get into the number of billions, but we hold uh, several billions of dollars of assets on our uh, books. We have to make sure that we protect them because this is a, a faith that the communities that we service and serve from have given us. The jurisdictions that we service and serve from have laid on us, and we cannot actually take that as lightly as uh, just living in the world. So, Peter, back to you. Yeah. 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 That's perfect, Peter. So, we, let's take you up on your challenge, shall we, on cybersecurity? Because I know Raphael and I uh, will just leap down on this. I do want to point out to everyone listening that. Even though I give Parameter a hard time, Rio Tinto's stock has actually traded at a five year high. So, congratulations. <laughs> 12 year high now. So, it's even better. Goodness, a happy, smiley face. Excellent. So, Raphael, I might start with you and then Emmett. So, or Emmett, first. No, let's go Raphael first. Is Raphael frozen? No. Raphael, it's yes. Raphael, I mean, you're dealing with companies all the time. And uh, I'm sure that's the number one priority. And then Emmett, over to you, I know that's an area you guys are investing heavily in, but Rafi, why don't you go first on this? Pick up. Uh, sure, sure. I, I share the experience we have. We have a lot of partners and suppliers that are from startup community, as well as startup as customers. So I, I tell you, it's extremely refreshing to see the number of innovation and the, the impact on the innovation that those companies are, are doing in, in different stacks of technology, either hardware, of software and services. So uh, we worked with companies that we've been through different stages of their uh, investment life, but also have been acquired by large corporations. What I do believe, and I've seen that multiple times, is basically companies that are acquired by big traditional or analog, what I call analog organization, and they are swallowed. And basically, either this uh, you know, uh, transplant are rejected by the organizations or is completely, uh, you know, the value proposition is completely uh, destroyed, if I, if I may use that word. So basically, what um, our experience working with startup companies, those startup companies that are very close to large corporation, they should not be integrated completely in the complex bureaucratic uh, enterprise, but they should be not too far uh, from the headquarter, but not too close to allow that innovation uh, to continue. So 
really, I mean, the, the startup community is much more agile, much more fast to create new ideas and bring them to to the market but on the flip side startup company do not have a history of business uh, management of and business reg, rigor and processes so i think really that is a win-win and, and teaming up startup with large corporation but the risk is that this corporation can basically uh, absorb and, and, and diminish or destroy the value proposition of those startups Thanks, Raphael. Emma, uh, do you want to take uh, probably up on the challenge? Uh, both startups you can talk about, but really into the cybersecurity <laughs> perspective. Well, as usual, I'd like to comment on both questions, if that's okay. That's um, I, I think what what would really help accelerate the the partnerships between um, startups, scale ups, and large global companies would be if uh, if global companies could really focus on the articulation of the problem. Um, I've noticed, um, a lot, and this goes back to what I've seen at incubators and accelerators, there's a lot of thinking around solutioning. And I think it, it's if, if organizations can flip their mindset and not worry about the solution, but really just focus in on the problem and get to the point where they can articulate the problem in a very simple way, then I think it's relatively easy to match. Um, startups and scale ups up against those problems and ultimately go solve them. So that'd be my my advice on how to um, lower the friction on those partnerships. Um, on cyber, I mean, my advice would be look for companies that are leveraging today's tech. For example, um, you know, we invested in a business called Devo, which is disrupting the traditional machine data space. Uh, Splunk has been the dominant player there for a long time. Devo is using cloud native technology. They were born in, in AWS and later they moved to GCP and, and Azure. And they can deliver the same capability for 10 cents on the dollar that's massively more scalable and massively more performant. So I think as a, as a CIO, you want to make sure, is that is that business cloud native? Um, we also just acquired a company called Armis, which is in the IoT space, and they're basically helping organizations understand how many agentless devices do I have? And that can be cameras, fish tanks, you know, machines, et cetera. What are all the devices that don't run software that I have out there that can be penetrated? So they do a risk assessment of that, and then they can actually secure those devices. And the way they do that is they're, they're sourcing data from 300 million devices globally. And they're look like, I'll use the silly um, analogy, the fish tank, they know what you know, specific model, make, year, et cetera, they know what normal is and what not normal is by looking at millions and millions and millions of these devices. So again, they're using cloud native technology, they're using AI, they're using sort of today's technology. So I think I think to solve the, the cyber challenges quickly um, that come with all this digital acceleration, it's it's really important to, to, to partner with companies that are using today's technology would be my advice there. Yeah, thank you, Emmett, on that. Yeah, it was funny, I was talking to one executive and she actually said, she was the VP of Transformation for an industrial company, she said uh, two things about that. One is, every time I ask my enterprise vendor for an update, the, the standard answer is that'll take 14 months, which is just kind of nuts, right? And she said, no matter how big our IT projects are, small or large, they all take 22 months. So uh, but these are kind of the challenges to your point, Emmett. So uh, we're coming down to the wire now so i'm going to ask each of you one more question i'll start with you raphael which is uh winners and losers so in this world of digital transformation i'd like each look into your crystal ball who are the winners who are the losers and you can look across the whole ecosystem for that uh, and then i'll do a quick wrap up and uh that'll end what i think's been a pretty insightful uh, discussion so raphael winners and losers uh in this world of digital transformation it, it is very hard to predict because my view is that current digital disruptor might be disrupted very quickly. I think now, post-pandemic, we're going to see a lot of companies that's going to appear and they're going to be successful in their digital transformation. So really, I, I, I don't think we know exactly right now. I would say that some companies, like if I take the IoT space, big names like Microsoft or Qualcomm, they have the ingredients. Uh, to make help companies to do their digital transformation. But at the same time, I really believe that newcomers are going to make also the difference. I mean, uh, like Emmett mentioned, there is hundreds and thousands of companies that have very interesting value proposition. What is very 
interesting. I think the market of, of companies is still, uh, you know, fragmented. I mean, I, that is not, we are not yet in the maturity of industry 4.0 or, or, or the fourth digital transformation. We are really at the beginning. So I think there will be a lot of great bet to companies, both small and large. Uh, and, and I think we are going to be very much surprises. What is, I think the key question I would put, not companies, but what are the technologies that are going to accelerate the digital transformation? Is it quantum, quantum computing? Is it really next level of AI? AI technology, we are really at the infancy of that technology. So I really would put the question is, what are the next technology disruption that's going to help digital transformation? Yeah. Now, Raphael, that's a good answer is we may not know who the winners are yet, right? Because they may not be with us quite yet. So uh, Paramita, uh, winners and losers from your perspective, and then no wrong or right answer to this. So uh, otherwise, we'd be rich if we know the winner answer. And then Emma, yeah. you'll take us home on this one. Yeah. Look, in my mind, I think it's very clear uh, from a winning perspective, any company that is ready to change, embrace change, and be collaborative, and be able to work with the whole supply chain ecosystem, I think it's a clear winner. You have to work with the ecosystem. You have to collaborate. Partnership is core. And very frankly, we have laid out our uh, strategy very clearly, and partnership is one of the four P's, along with our people, four performance less its partnership. On the losing side, I would say anybody who's waiting and watching to see, let's see what the post-COVID world looks like is probably going to be a little surprised when the doors open. And I use this word very carefully when the doors open. It's, we can define what happens out there today. We actually owe it to us and to humanity to change the world we define through this tectonic shift that has taken place in the past few months. And whoever is sitting to let um, let this, and I, and I know it's, it will sound very ironic to call it this, uh, but this is a crisis that we need to come out and redefine how we want to shape the world and shape human progress in the future. So whoever is waiting and watching, I wouldn't want to be on that show. Okay. So, uh, you say, everyone listening, you need to examine yourself. Are you a waiter or a watcher or embracing change and uh, collaboration? So, Emma, again, I mean, this is the whole job of a fund, right? Picking winners and losers. <laughs> That's a tough question. I'm thinking of it more philosophically. I mean, oh. uh, the way we pick our investments is, you know, we have a very sophisticated process to find companies that have unlocked, and we really make our investments based on how fast are they growing already, how large is the market that they're serving and how strong is the leadership team? So we've got a very um, straightforward strategy there for investing. But I think the question you're asking is much, much bigger. And I think if you think about Steve Jobs and what he accomplished, if you think about uh, Jeff Bezos and what he accomplished, um, if you think about Bill Gates and, and what he accomplished, it's basically understanding the intersection of the customer and what the needs of the customer are and the next generation technology that's coming and, and marrying those two things together at the right moment. I mean, those are gonna be the winners, right? So there's been a lot of talk about um, the customer and putting the customer at the center of the digital strategy, et cetera, et cetera. But I think now we're in a spot where it actually has to be done. You really have to understand the customer, you really have to understand their needs. You have to understand the timing around when are they ready to adopt something. And then you have to understand all the technologies that we talked about 5G, IoT, cloud data, et cetera. And you have to marry those two things together. And, and those are going to be the winners from my point of view. Emma, thank you very much. And thank you, all of you. So just wrapping up, this has been a fascinating discussion. So we kind of kicked off COVID. It was really breaking us out of the theater of digital. Thank you. Emma, sorry, Peter, I, 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 the hype. sorry, Peter, I have a question back to you. What's your answer to that question? Who are the winners and losers? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a good one. You can't get away from it. I think if you take it from the demand side, which is organizations that are consuming digital, I think you kind of got it. But I think it's really have to rethink their hierarchy and driving down responsibility to individual people and create learning cultures that move quickly and are much more learning. And I think agile, it's 
agile I'm talking about because you can do things in sprints that are old and slow. So you just take old and make it 90 day sprints. So I think that's really key. How do you break down the mindset of a company? I think Emmett got it. I'm, I'm a tech guy, I'm a software guy. So that ability to really, I mean, honestly, the companies talk about their technology all day, but what's the use case? So really understanding what a customer does, but it takes big companies to be able to articulate that effectively. That's a, that's a problem. And then, and then being able to navigate large companies to scale their solution effectively. I think that's the magic. The creating it and then scaling it. That's my, I look at characteristics. I'd be rich if I was able to make the company. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, you know, I've been breaking out of the theatre of digital, which I think is really great. So we're actually into the real world now. Um, I think, Pamina, you talked about how do we maintain this crisis mindset? Do you, you said, do we have a choice? We don't have the luxury to go back to what we did. Um, Raphael, you talked about to drive success, you know, you need a clear vision from the CEO. You know, you need a shift in mindset and culture. You need new metrics. You need the right talent and you need to move with speed and agility. Right? And these are both if you're a tech company or a consumer of technology and digital, you need to have these attributes to be successful. Um, I think, Emmett, your kind of analysis around what's different about this uh, from other pandemics, that professor that we're talking, is that we're seeing structural change that we haven't seen before, which could turbo, turbo a lot of the change. Uh, Pamini talked about think like a startup every day, really important, but also being much more collaborative. And I think a lot of companies are kind of in transactional procurement mode. They need to be nurture an ecosystem, build it and collaborate with it and become friendly for startups, right? Uh, Emmett, spin out. Companies have to learn to spin out more, to unleash innovation. And Raphael, you talked about that as well. You know, let innovation thrive and keep your core operating as it should. Um, and I think your study, MIT study, Emmett, you mentioned fantastic. You know, uh, 20, only 24% of companies have a digital board, but they outperform the other 76%. So I think a challenge for incumbents, how do I transform board from being a governance oriented, which has been really the past 10 years, one that's more digital oriented. And that's a total restructuring of board membership thinking. So that's really exciting. Um, so really, that's it. I mean, I think hopefully we've given everyone that's listening an opportunity and some deep, deeper insights into what digital transformation and how to be successful. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Peter, Raphael, and Emmett. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been fantastic. As we all uh, navigate the digital Rubicon and uh, and drive success. So, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, wish everyone to join us for the rest of Twin Tech. And uh, your, I see you right in the middle there. You want to say a few words before we uh, uh, leave? Uh, of course. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I mean, that, that was great. I, I knew that this program was in good hands uh, with you and all four of the panelists. I mean, you are all four in the middle of this of these transformations. Uh, Paramita, you said waiting and watching is going to fail. I think we all feel that. And, and, and I'd have to say the people with us today watching this are probably the, the survivors because they've self-selected to be here to spend the time to think about these things to make this happen. So the biggest challenge we have with new technologies is often getting people to try it for the first time. And guess what? With COVID, they tried it for the first time. And things are happening as a result really, really fast. Raphael, um, I, I leave it to you to three times in your segments uh, bring up massive issues like the first time in human history. And another time you talked about Darwinian evolution. So the French educational system, Raphael, is working its magic. I would like to point out with respect to evolution that there is a concept of evolution that came after Darwin called punctuated equilibrium. And what this says is most of evolution happens relatively slowly, uh, ploddingly over many, many years. And then there are short periods of time when everything happens all at once. And this is the punctuation in which we are right now. Going through that, we have to set different metrics, as Raphael, you shared, to overcome the tyranny of the metrics that worked in the past because they won't work in the future. Um, Paramita, why weren't we doing this before? And I love the fact that you shared early on both the mental and physical well-being of your employees and your customers and your partners as well as this radical shift for demand for things 
which if you think about it, a lot of the demand for services has been sucked over to demand for physical things because of the lockdown. And this is a rapid transformation of moving physical goods all over the world. Um, Peter Bryant, uh, my great partner, pointed out work, mindset, culture change. These are really the pivotal factors that companies have to get their heads around. You can think about the intellectual factors, but unless you can feel into and create and build the this urgency uh, and a vision for what we want to create, you won't get anywhere. And maintaining the urgency, as you pointed out, that really is the role for leadership, to maintain the urgency of the important things, even when events outside aren't allowing that. Emmett, you said the cloud, people were speaking before the cloud's done. Well, as you said, we're just getting started. Uh, I, I, Mural, you one example of uh, an instrument partner's uh, portfolio company. I follow you guys closely because of our relationship. And I have to say, you are in the middle of all of this. Stuff. There's there's an inside ventures imprimatur on so many of these deals. And uh, I would urge everybody on uh, with us today to keep an eye on Insight, uh, to connect with uh, Insight Ignite, uh, which Emmett mentioned. This is the social network that helps us stay ahead of all this stuff. Invest at the inflection point, you said. That's what Insight tries to do. Guess what, everybody? This is the inflection point for all of us. It's time to invest. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, and I can't wait to see everybody next week, September 22nd, 24th. Uh, for everyone in live stream, thanks so much for joining us. A big apology for the challenges we had earlier. Welcome to the Digital Rubicon. Uh, we'll be uh, polished and ready for next week. See everybody very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right.